Welcome to Sense Making Conversations. My name is Andrea Sampson, and I'll be your host and guide as we de delve deeply into the issues impacting us all. So what's impacting you this week? Well, I know for me, the new restrictions that have just been, or the continuing restrictions that have just been announced, they're really starting to get to me. I mean, the reality is, it feels like nothing has changed, right? I mean, I know that's not really true, but it, sometimes it feels that way. Last week, um, if you joined us, we had well-being expert Louisa Jewell with us, and she talked to us about some strategies to help us with that heavy feeling. Um, because sometimes I do get that heavy feeling and feeling of over, overwhelm and feeling of hopelessness. And that's where she was helping us with this concept of ripples and waves. Now, if you didn't see last week's uh, episode, I'd suggest you go to our YouTube channel. It's there. It was a fantastic episode. And what she talked about, and I thought it was worth recapping, because I have a feeling that Mary and I are going to pick this up today. She talked about something she called ripples and waves. Now, ripples, just to recap, were the simple things that you can do throughout your day. So a ripple could be planning that every time you go to the washroom on the way back, you're going to pet your cat or you're going to cuddle with your child, something that brings you joy. It's a moment that you plan in your day. And maybe you have five or 10 of these throughout your day. And what happens is you get a cumulative effect of joy throughout your day. That's a ripple. A wave. A wave is something that is a little bit longer. And, you know, it's the, it's the creation of hope. And I think that's been one of the challenges for many of us. This has gone on for a very long time. And hope has been a little bit impacted, right? And so a wave is where we create a dream. So think about, so for me, I love to travel. And while I can't book a trip right now, and that really is frustrating and makes me sad, quite frankly. But what I can do is I can dream about my next trip. So I can dream about where I'm going to go to. I can think about who I'm going to go with. I can think about the food I'm going to eat when I'm there, the sites that I'm going to see. I can even plan it down to the minute. I may not be able to book it, but I can plan it. That's a wave. So ripples and waves help us to sort of build a cumulative effect of hope. But you know, where we are today, for many of us, we're in a place of overwhelm because suddenly we are working from home. We've got kids, maybe we've got spouses, and we've got a death that's omnipresent. It's there all the time. That feeling of day to day can real that feeling of overwhelm from day to day can really impact us. Working from home means we never really stop working, right? You know, a recent study done by NordVPN team. So this is a company that provides virtual private networks for large organizations. They started to notice that there was an increase in the use of the VPN. And in fact, on average, what they noticed is that people were working two and a half hours more every day. That's on average. That means some are working way more than that. So an eight hour day turns into an almost 11 hour day. And, you know, if you are already working the 10, 11 hour days, it's even more. We're never stopping working. And while ripples and waves can help us with overall well-being, what can we do to make sure that we don't end up creating a new epidemic of burnout? And this is why I'm so excited. My guest today, Dr. Mary Donahue, a dear friend, and a recognized and respected social scientist who studies the impact of digital technology and its communications on our well being. Dr. Mary, as she's known to many, has just released her most recent book, Message Received, that looks at our digital communications habits and how they're impacting our mental and emotional well being. She founded the Digital Wellness Center in 2020 in order to provide people with the tools to calibrate a work-life balance digitally. Her work has been used by Microsoft, Walmart, American Airlines, TD Bank, and many, many more. Dr. Mary holds a doctorate in education, is an in-demand speaker, an author, a writer, a podcaster, 
and her work has been featured in the Huffington Post, Bloomberg, Harvard Business Review, and many peer-reviewed journals. Welcome, Mary. Wow, thanks, Andrea. Did my mom write that for you? <laughs> How about just say, here's Mayor? <laughs> <laughs> well, because you know what? Our guests have to know the expert who you are and what you bring to this conversation. I am okay. so incredibly grateful to have you with us. Thank you, you for know, inviting me. You know, I thought we could start this conversation, and burnout is such an important topic, right? I mean, so many people are really feeling it. Um, and I thought that maybe we could start off with maybe an easy question of what is burnout and how do we recognize the signs? Burnout is now a medical syndrome. It can be diagnosed. It was in May 2019, as I talk about in my book, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, said so many people are burning out that it is now a syndrome. And it's that feeling of exhaustion. It's that feeling of negativity at work. So for example, when you get emails from certain people and you're like, oh my God, I'm so sick of you. Or when you don't feel productive. Mm -hmm. So no matter what happens as you're going through your day, you're spinning your wheels and you think at the end of the day, what did I get done? And you don't believe you've gotten anything done. And you have, but you don't believe it. And what begins to happen is you start to spiral down into what we talk about in the book, which is chronic anxiousness. And that begins to take you into constant flight or flight, which then just begins that physical spiral down that accompanies burnout. Yeah, that's, um, it's challenging. And I think we've all felt that this, this year has been a year where um, so much has taken our attention, right? I mean, so many people are in that place of, you know, kids who are now being homeschooled, husbands or wives who are working now literally beside you, and of course, the fight for bandwidth. Um, and so we're, we're, we're never feeling that we're in that place of completion. It's like we're always midpoint through a task. And did I end up finishing that? You know, I, you know, if you look at my screen, I think I have 15, maybe 200 tabs open. <laughs> and, you know, it's largely because I've been, I'm, I'm doing many different things. And so I know I'm not alone. I, I've been on enough Zoom calls and seen full screens to know we're all in that place. Um, you know, so how do we start to help ourselves? Because the reality is this is not changing, you know? So it, it, even, even if we go back, back to um, a different style of working, I think the reality of, of where we are, the exhaustion that we're in is we're bringing it with us. So how do we, how do we begin to help ourselves? The first thing we have to start doing is, is creating boundaries. So when we look at a burnout reduction plan, I, I came to burnout because as you know, as a personal friend, I spiraled down and it almost killed me. And the thing about burnout is you don't know what's happening to you. You just begin to get more frustrated and you're in a bad mood and people aren't making sense. And it's always everybody else that's the problem. <laughs> I, I can't believe that was you, Mary. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Talk about a total bitch. But, you know, oh, sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that on you. But it's, I'm saying about me, so I guess I can. But um, what begins to happen is you have to take control of your day and just do a quick little burnout checklist, which is where I like to start. You know, am I waking up and am I working? Am I working through lunch? Do I pass my breaks and just say, okay, I'll do it more. I'll, I'll give myself a treat at the end of the day. And is that treat at the end of the day, maybe junk food, or do you just collapse on the couch? Or is it, you know, just one of those other coping mechanisms we've been having? So just begin to look at yourself that way. Now take another check. Take a look at your email box. When you're responding to email and when you're sending an email, what is the tone you hear in your head of that email? Mm -hmm. For me, it was a milestone when I realized that I was emailing my daughter and I sounded like a nagging bitch. And I started to look at all my different emails that I was sending to everybody. And instead of being helpful, 
I started to perceive myself as like horrible. And I wondered what was causing that. Now, the other, my friend's perceptions wasn't that, but I was rushing through things. There was tons of different spelling errors. There was just like, there wasn't a hello. There wasn't a hi. It was get this done. It was very curt, which as you know, isn't my tendency. Yeah. So then I began to look at how other people were responding to me and they weren't. So that type of communication didn't work with others. And then I began to do a physical check. Do you wake up with a headache? Are your eyes, are your eyes tired? Are you constantly feeling like you need a glass of water? Is your tummy bloated? Do you have tummy issues? How about your legs? Are your legs tired? Do you always get pins and needles? That's where I'd begin to start checking. It's really interesting. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that you're saying in here that are so important. So the idea, first of all, of how are we um, creating that sense of reward for ourselves, that sense of, I'm going to give myself something back. Are we treating ourselves with things that are actually taking us further down? So we're just collapsing and eating junk food, which, you know, actually then starts to impact our body. Um, or are we doing things that are, um, that are helpful and taking us in other ways? Then we look at our physicality. Um, you know, what is our physicality? Are we doing things to support the body? Are we feeling pain? Are we feeling, um, are we feeling uh, like wanting to run away, you know, because this like feeling of that, and then the way in which we are interacting with others. So seeing ourselves, so you, what you're really saying, what I think is so brilliant about what you're saying is take stock of yourself first. And but look at the way in which you're impacting others. So through the lens of the self, look to the other. And so we can first look internally and say, do we have clues that we're ignoring? What are the red flags? You know, like that headache every morning. Maybe you should start, you know, like it's not just that you didn't sleep well. Maybe it is, but the likelihood is it's got a root much deeper. And so listening to the flags that I love that idea of reading your own emails and looking at the tone in your own email. Wow. Like that's, you know, if I think about it and it's something that I, I do a lot of because I work in communications, as you know, and so I'm constantly looking at my own emails and making sure that I am adding the dear so-and-so or, Hey, how are you doing? Because when I know when I get fast, when I get stressed, those go away. I'm in a conversation in my head right. so you know because that's what it is right i'm in my own conversation not with the other person in the book we call it voice in your head syndrome mm. so you know so what do we do like so yes we can recognize all of these things and i know that you've recently um created a tool or um a, a way in which to help ourselves so tell me a little bit about that tell me about the what you've created and why you created it so we've created the, the digital wellness center and the digital wellness center is to help you grow your wellness through digital so it sounds like an oxymoron but it's not um 82 of us can't give up our phone that's the big problem, Andrea. And, and a lot of our issues come from the fact that we can now work just by our phone and alone in our house. So the very first thing we do is we use a principle called transient hyperfrontality to create micro interventions. So transient hyperfrontality, think about it as just a mind clear. It's like sweeping away the stress and it's micro. And what we do is give you tiny little micro interventions in your day that allow your brain just to take a little break. Think about it this way. Your brain is a runner. So the front part of your brain is your arms pumping and the middle part of your brain is your legs pumping. And right here, your reptilian brain is your heart going boom, 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 boom when you're running. Well, if you run all the time, your arms begin to droop. And then all of a sudden your legs begin to go slower and you begin to drag your butt. That's burnout. So what we found is when you create these little micro interventions and just give them into the learning, your instinctive part of your brain right here, we can give you a little more energy in your day. As a matter of fact, we can give you 10% more energy in the day because you know me, if it's not measured, it's not real. So 
Um, and what that does to you is it makes you happier. Mm. And so in my case, I began to realize that these tiny little micro interventions also change you physically. So my blood, as you know, I have chronic leukemia and burnout really set it in motion. And I didn't take anybody seriously until they said to me, oh, by the way, you're going to start chemo. Uh, oh, by the way, no, I'm not. What the heck are you talking about? So this is my actual response to doctors. What do you know? And so my oncologists were like, your organs are failing. And that's what I mean by we all seem to push these things away. I knew my stomach hurt. I knew my heart was beating faster. I knew it was harder to catch my breath. But did I put the three of those things together seriously? No. You know, so what? that's it. Go ahead. You're just reminding me as you're talking about this, and I think it's important, you know, this idea of happiness, like feeling happy. How are you feeling? And I was, I was listening to um, Brene Brown uh, yesterday, actually. And one of the things that she talked about, which I thought was fascinating, she said, you know, when, and she's a researcher, as you know, and they were researching happiness and she, or actually researching emotions. And she said, you know, when we ask people um, what emotions they feel throughout a day, how many do you think they can name? And, you know, I was thinking, I don't know, maybe 10. No, actually people can name three emotions, happy, sad, pissed off. That's it. Yeah. And the reality is what we need to be able to, um, to, to be able to name are 30. So 10 times the amount of emotions. And so when I'm listening to you, this idea of happiness because I think there are degrees and there are different forms of happiness, right? So tell me what your thoughts, as you hear that, and like, what do you think in the, in the world of burnout, as we get into naming of emotions, because I do think that's important. Um, tell me a little bit about that. So one of the things about burnout that most people don't realize is um, that it can be managed. Mm. My big aha moment came in 2018 when I was doing research with Microsoft. What I found is when I gave people the tools to communicate clearly, their stress went down. And when their stress went down, they became more productive. And when we got more time in our day, we were happier. And when we were happier, we took more time for self. So let's just think about that because yeah. we have all been trained in what I call the Queens of Hearts theory. So in Alice in Wonderland, the Queen of Hearts says, jam tomorrow, jam yesterday, but never jam today, which means don't treat yourself, you know, think about it another time or you probably had a treat yesterday. So get rid of that Queen of Hearts theory and treat yourself today. So learn for 30 seconds every day or 60 seconds, learn something new. We do physical movements, we do communication, and then we also work on your sleep, like how to plan for sleep during the day. Burnout is cured by feeling of accomplishment. And that's what humans love, Andrea, is understanding how to accomplish and get stuff done. That's what drives us. And here's another fun fact most people don't understand. 80% of our drive is to help others. Did you like it? That's I talked about recently on another podcast, which was bringing our humanity back. We need to bring back that humanity to feel good. And a really well crafted email or text allows us to feel a little more human hmm. when we understand something and accomplished. I love that yeah. the, the, the remedy for burnout, I was wondering, because I think that's so important. The remedy for burnout is a feeling of accomplishment, a feeling that we got something done. You know, as you started off earlier, you were saying, you know, we constantly are feeling that we never get anything done. We, we may have, but we don't feel like we have. And when we think about those cycles, it's like we're always in an incomplete. And so the feeling of accomplishment allows us to come back to a place of equilibrium. I mean, that's really kind of what it is or equanimity, right? We're into that place. And, and where you were just going, and I wanna delve into sleep because I think it's so important. People aren't sleeping as well as they used to. Why, what's happening with our sleep and how is it impacting burnout? 
It's because our mind is constantly on our work because our work is in our house, our work is in our head. And so what we do to get that feeling of equilibrium is the night before you go to bed, list three things you want to accomplish the next day. If you accomplish one at the end of the day, for me, I just use like a little sticky and I check things off on what I've accomplished, but I have a visual. When you're going to sleep at night, what we all tend to do is think about the things we didn't get done. What you need to think about are the good things, the things you got done. That's the number one thing we do in sleep wellness is we retrain your brain, which is your mammalian brain, to look for new patterns in your day. So did you get out of bed? Yes, great, you got something done. Did you drink water? Yes, great, you got something done. Did you shower or did you put on socks? Yay, that's three things you got done in one day. And don't laugh because I know people who have spent their whole pandemic almost in their jammies. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, did you wash your jammies today? Now, well, let's delve a little deeper into that. Let's like, this is like counting sheep, but for burnout. So what was it like? Where did you go when you had that glass of water? Did you drink from a filter? Did you drink from the top? You see how I'm taking your brain to a different area? That's what we're training people to do. Mm -hmm. um, what did I hear today that was fun from a friend, a partner? You know, like we had a great walk and it was cold, but there was lots of sunshine. What did that sunshine feel like on my face? These are the questions I want you to start asking yourself at night, because when you are negative and most of us are 90% negative with self, which is an interesting statistic that drives burnout, turn that even by 10%, Andrea, by starting to count the things you actually got done. Mm -hmm. Hey, I realized I'm tired. Let me look at my emails and see what I did. Maybe I can do something better. That's what I would do, you know? One of the things that, you know, and you and I have talked a little bit about this, um, and I think it's important for this conversation, is what are those daily, you know, habits and practices? One of the things that um, in many of us have heard about doing gratitudes, and they're important, right? Because gratitudes take us out of that negative, they put us into a place of positive, what are we, what are we grateful for? One of the things that I do as well as gratitudes, and I think it's, it's um, getting at exactly what you're talking about, is acknowledgments. Acknowledgement of the self. Today, I acknowledge myself for, and it's a it's a it's a written practice. So you write it. You don't have to share it with anyone, but it's a helpful practice, I think, in terms of doing exactly what you're describing. And it it's where you get to be your own cheerleader. And we're never our own cheerleaders, right? We're our own worst critics. But when was the last time you went? I'm my best cheerleader. You know, we don't do that. And so when we do, though. What a, you know, you start to see, and, and it was maybe to your point, the only thing you've got to acknowledge yourself for was getting out of bed. And that's okay. That's okay. That's right. Right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I love the time about acknowledgement. Like I'm actually running a sleep wellness challenge next week uh, because we do the exercises, we do the routines, we do everything. I really want people to embrace this concept of digital wellness, but I have to do sleep wellness. We're going to do it at 10 o'clock at night and I'm going to lead you through three exercises. I know you're shocked. I'm actually going to try and stay up till 10 o'clock, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> but I'm a big believer in setting your body up just your body to get rest and to build a routine. And so that's worked for hundreds of years. Coming back into that, the physicality of who we are is so important. I see that Allison has a question. She, she just said 90% of us are, are negative to self. That's so powerful. She wants to know, is there a gender lens to that? And I know you have an answer <laughs> to that one. <laughs> yes. Yes, there is. But, um, one of the things we found in the Digital Wellness Center, and we launched in January, but you, we collect data all the time and we tell everybody we're collecting data, is we found that men are gravitating more towards the Digital Wellness Center because they want those micro interventions. They want the help for sleep. They'll use it six times more than women because women are doing, you and I have called, like I've called it this ice cream theory. Ooh, we have to earn wellness in the same way we earn an ice cream cone. So if you're dieting or, or watching your healthy eating or whatever, you don't just go and have an ice cream cone. You've got to earn that ice cream by running 50,000 miles. Well, no, in fact, you don't. 
And I'm not sure where that came from for women. So get rid of that belief. And I'm actually through the Digital Wellness Center, we're encouraging men to help women get rid of that self doubt. You deserve wellness just like someone else. So let's give you some scheduling to do it. And we are always pushing off our self care. That's the number one reason women have heart attacks is they don't go and say, hey, I think I need a little help. Well, it's so interesting, isn't it? You know, I mean, the, the, the societal perception is that, you know, women have their spa days and they go and they do all this self-care, but yet it's not actually happening. Those spa days might happen once a year, if that, or, <laughs> right. And so the, you know, this, this generalized, you know, the, the, the fiction is that women take care of themselves. But I think what you're saying is so incredibly powerful is that we believe that those are treats, that those are things we have to earn. And like, think about that wellness. We have to earn our own wellness. Like that's a crazy thought. We that's why women are leaving the workforce four times more than men. I hate to interrupt you, but we yeah. have never been taught self-care properly. And it's not attributes. It's not like go garden and hug a teddy bear and drink water. They're all important. But you've actually got to start thinking about interventions that will make a change in your life and you deserve them. And I'm saying this to the men too that are suffering. It's incredibly important to start looking at the interventions that work. Um, and another Allison just asked, um, she, she says, Mary, just interested if you are addressing switching off Wi-Fi with sleep routines and generally being aware of our exposure to it and how stepping away also gives the brain a break. Absolutely. Um, we advocate all of these different um, aspects of things. But the other thing is um, you need to look at the content you're watching in the evening. So for me, it's the news. I can only watch the news like between 6.30 and 6.45. That's all I can take. Otherwise, it runs through my brain. Um, if you're watching violent, angry shows, that's going to put you in a very different mood. Like we have to look at all the technology. It's not just on our phone. And then look at what you're reading. So create a routine for yourself at night. This sounds crazy, but use some water. Wash your hands, wash your feet, wash your face, have a bath, take a shower. That's the very first transition for your brain. Because mm -hmm. you don't take a shower, then go to meeting after meeting after meeting, and then take another shower and go. So you want a transition zone. And then another routine, I, you could use writing in a journal or reading a book. And read a book that, you know, something you liked as a kid. So if it's the Judy Bloom series, or maybe it's Where's Waldo, or it's something, take five or 10 minutes to bring back that feeling of joy. So Allison, this is how we're beginning to get rid of giving you actual tactics of how to get off Wi-Fi. And then let's look at the physicality of sleep. Let's look at the exercises you need to do to relax where fight or flight starts, which is in your chest and in your neck. And then how do you bring it down into your stomach? How do you bring it into your legs? And that's really some of the ways we want to show you to get your physical self off this or this, which is digital. Right. We're almost out of time, but I do oh, no. want to actually bring this in because you and I have talked about this a lot, which is meditation. How does meditation mm -hmm. help with burnout? Meditation, there's a lot of different types of meditation as well. In the very beginning, I was the worst meditator on the face of the planet because I'd be like, Siri, create a memo too, or reminder too. Meditation can simply be sitting and looking at out a window. We go back to transient hyperfrontality. <laughs> Sorry, my phone just said dumb. <laughs> um, we can actually, Albert Einstein used to sit in a bathtub and look at bubbles for one hour a day and he took a walk for 45 minutes every day. That was his meditation, a walking meditation. It does, it, transient hyperfrontality takes place. You clear the frontal lobe of the brain so that you're allowing this, your, meta, your uh, mammalian part of your brain and your reptilian part of the brain to just relax. And when you do it, you'll physically feel your shoulders go down. You'll physically feel your heart rate lower. And just begin with a minute. I never recommend anybody start longer than that. Even just walking for a minute down your hall, something you can accomplish. 
but feel your heart rate go. And as you're walking, focus on your feet. Look down and look at the floor so that your head isn't up and you're picturing things. Yeah, so, so powerful. And I think just to add one thing to that, which is to do it consistently. Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent consistently. Even try it once a day for a minute, for 30 yeah. days. And just, yeah, for just, just a minute, but for 30 days. And that accomplishment is there. That sense of the clearing is there. Like it does so much, right? Um, feeling and and it can be the thing that you tick off at the end of the day. I did my one minute of looking out the window. Um, and the reason I, I can I just interrupt and tell you a funny story because you'll appreciate this. So I bought this whole meditation app when I first had my concussion and I'd been hit by a car. And people who haven't had a concussion, you don't understand the anger associated with it. I bought this meditation app. She's like, focus your brain, focus your mind, empty it, blah, blah, blah. By the end of three minutes, I was so mad. I took my phone and I whipped it across the room. I was like, stop telling me to focus. So when I say just start with one minute and maybe just walk, it's for people more like me that really need to bring down that stress. Mary, this has been a fantastic, fantastic conversation. I have enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Me too. Thank you for bringing your, yeah, thank you for bringing your brilliance and for letting us all understand a little bit more about this concept of burnout, but also what are the things we can do? And you've given us some really practical tips. Um, This is definitely one that um, I'm going to share out. I always share all of them out, but I'm going to, this one, uh, because it's so practical, it's listen to these tips. Um, and this brings us to the end of this week's sense making conversation. Now, you mentioned the Digital Wellness Center. Um, where can guests go to get a little bit more about your Digital Wellness Center? Um, I will definitely send you a link. I'd love to give each of your guests a, a free month in the Digital Wellness Center. Perhaps your team can send that out. I don't want anybody's emails. It's all okay. Um, or they could go to the Digital Wellness Center, C E N T E R.com. So the American spelling, sorry. <laughs> and you can go and check that out there, or you can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, any of those. I'd love to chat and help anybody who needs it. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, next week, we'll be back same time with Jody Medic. Jody is um, a, a researcher and a creator in the area of what she calls superhumans, not supercomputers. She teaches humans the right buttons to push um, to help make them understand tech even better. So be sure to join us next week same time. And in this week, as you move through this time, make sure you spend some time relaxing, staring out the window, taking your one minute to recoup and accomplish something. Have an amazing week. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks.